But whatever her illness may have been, it was real enough to her and dangerously so at times. The picture of helpless indolence, she calls herself, sublimely helpless and impotent. I had done living, I thought. Was ever life so like death before? My face was so close against the tombstones that there seemed no room even for the tears. Those are our words from Elizabeth Barrett Browning, an English poet from the 1800s. Um, read, I read that from this book here, Sonnets from the Portuguese and Other Love Poems. Those are words of hers describing herself. Picture of helpless indolence sublimely helpless and impotent. Her face was so close against the tombstone, there was no room for tears. Can you feel the, the sadness of her vision of herself? Have you ever seen eyes that viewed their own self with so much sadness, with such pity? Here I am making my way through Elizabeth Barrett Browning's love poems, um, her sonnets, love poems, that she wrote for her husband before they were married and gave to him afterwards. Never have I walked through such sad love poems. Um, when I stepped into these sonnets, these love poems, I thought I was going to step into this grand hall of love, an outpouring of love, a consuming feeling of love. And while there is some feeling of love in these poems, the thing that I come away with when I sit in the middle of her words is the admiration that she looks at her husband with and her view of his rich self, his beautiful, wonderful self, and her sad, sad view of herself. I think the contrast of her eyes, when she looks at her own self, what she sees versus what she sees when she looks at her husband, it is a drastically different world that she sees. It is a drastically different vision that she looks at herself versus when she sees her husband. And it, to me, to stand in the middle of a place with, in her vision, of so much poverty, sitting right to, next to so much wealth is oddly like very heartbreaking. Um, it's super weird. Um, today we're gonna explore quickly two of her sonnets. 
Um, it's number eight and number nine. They're right beside each other. Um, and the thing that I want you to sort of notice is her view of herself versus the view she has of her lover, her husband. Okay, this is number eight. What can I give thee back, O liberal and princely giver, who has brought the gold and purple of thine heart, unstained, untold, and laid them on the outside of the wall, for such as I to take or leave withal an unexpected largesse? Am I cold, ungrateful, that for these most manifold high gifts I render nothing back at all? No, not so cold, but very poor instead. Ask God who knows. For frequent tears have run the colors from my life and left so dead and pale a stuff it were not fitly done to give the same pillow to thy hat to thy head. Go farther, let it serve to trample on. Did you feel that? Like, could you feel the contrast of her? husband or her lover with herself what can I give thee back a liberal and princely giver who has brought the gold and purple of thine heart unstained untold and laid them on the outside of the wall for such as I to take or leave with all so here is this this princely giver who is so liberal in his giving and he's brought gold the gold and purple of his heart and lay them on the outside of the wall for her to take or leave i'm like this makes me want to cry um and then she says so you have this like great richness um, this man leaving the gold and purple of his heart. Like she sees his heart as like noble and princely and like the, as valuable as gold. And he's leaving it outside the wall of her heart maybe. And she says, am I cold, ungrateful? For these most manifold high gifts that I render nothing back at all. Why is she giving nothing back at all? She says she is not cold, but she is poor. Ask God who knows. For frequent tears have run the colors from my life. And left so dead and pale a stuff, it were not fitly done to give the same as a pillow to thy head. Go farther, let it serve to trample on. I'm like, I don't know if I've ever heard such a sad, like, a view of oneself compared to another person. <laughs> oh, like, oh, like it breaks my heart. Um, so she is talking about, she said, ask God who knows. For frequent tears have run the colors from my life. So she has had so much sadness and tears that it has drained the color from her life and left so dead and pale a stuff it's so her tears have drained all the color from her life and left something so pale and dead 
that it's not fit to give the same stuff as a pillow for his head. Go further, let it serve to trample on. So here she is going on and on about this other person being a princely giver who brought gold and purple from his heart unstained, untold, and laid them on the outside of the wall. For her, I mean, these manifold high gifts. But what she has left to give is so pale and dead, it's not even fit for a pillow for his head. So she's like, go, go on. Um, what I have to give is only, it only serves to be trampled on. Um, to me, I'm like, that is the, like, this is the saddest, like, this is the saddest poem. <laughs> I'm like, the idea of having somebody love you who's that rich and then feeling like all you have to give that person isn't even worth walking on. Like all it's fit for is trampling. Like the other person is giving gold and purple from their heart and you, all you have to give from your heart is dead pale stuff that all it's good for is being trampled on. I'm like, this is a love poem for her husband. Like this, Elizabeth Barrett wrote these sonnets while she, um, before she was married to her husband and then gave them to the him, I believe after they were married. And I'm imagining him reading this love poem that she wrote for him and wondering how he felt when he read it, like to see how she viewed him and how she viewed herself. The very next sonnet, number nine, it says, can it be right to give what I can give, to let thee sit beneath the fall of tears? As salt as mine, and hear the sighing years, re-sighing on my lips, renunciative, through those infrequent smiles which fail to live, for all thy adjurations. Oh, my fears that this scarce be right. We are not peers. So to be lovers, and I own and grieve, that givers of such gifts as mine are, must be counted with the ungenerous. Out, alas, I will not soil thy purple with my dust, nor breathe my poison on thy Venus glass, nor give thee any love which were unjust. Beloved, I love, I only love thee, let it pass. This to me, like, is, um, it's sad. It, can it be right to give what I can give? Like this idea that of a person wanting to love another person, but feeling like they have nothing to give that what they have to give is you can sit beneath the fall of tears. You can sit beneath my tears and hear all my sighing years. And those infrequent smiles which fail to live. It's like this. She has moments of like trying to smile, but those smiles try to live, but they never actually like really live. This can scarce be right. We are not peers. 
so to be lovers and I own and grieve that givers of such gifts as mine are must be counted as ungenerous. Out, alas, I will not soil thy purple with my dust, nor breathe my poison on thy venous glass. Like she tells, it feels like she's telling him to leave. I don't know. Have you ever read someone like see themselves as so unvaluable and another person as so valuable that they tell them to leave. I won't soil your purple with my dust. I'm like, holy crap. Like, this was for her husband. <laughs> like, this makes me want to cry. <clears throat> like, like, that is like one of the saddest sentences I've ever heard. I will not soil thy purple with my dust. It's like she looks at him as something so um, amazing and royal and rich. And it's like, and then she looks at herself like and what she has to offer in regards to love as dust and like what she has to bring to the table is going to mess up this good thing that's him. Like this purple, this royal, this rich thing that is this man that she seems to be in love with, she sees as like her, she sees herself as almost like nothing. She doesn't want to mess him up with her nothingness. Um, or breathe my poison on thy venous glass. Like to view your own breath as poison. I don't know what a venous glass is. Do you know what a venous glass is? Okay, I imagine, it's, when I imagine Venice, you know, I'm like Italy, um, Venice glass. Are those glasses? Is that a cup? Like, I don't know. But um, I guess in my head it conjures up something valuable. Um, Nor give thee any love which were unjust. Yeah, her idea of being in love with someone this rich, it feels wrong. It feels like unjust, like it's unjust to this man for him, for her to try to give him love because he is so much more valuable than her. <sighs> What do you, I mean, what do you think of these sonnets? Like these are sonnets that are compared to um, being almost as great as Shakespeare sonnets. Um, sonnets are sort of known for being about love. These are something she wrote for her husband. Um, I'm trying to imagine what it would be like to receive this if her husband loved her at all. I feel like it would be really hard to hear someone 
think so highly of you and then turn around and talk so degradingly about themselves. Um, I guess I imagine if he actually loves Elizabeth Barrett Browning that he probably, he couldn't possibly see her love as dust or fit to be trampled on, right? I'm like, is, are these poems, like, are these accurate betray portrayals of these two people? Like, is he this rich and she this poor? Is he have everything to offer and she have nothing? Um, it's kind of got that feeling of like, oh, like that, like. Cinderella feeling of yeah it makes me wonder if I'm like did he like these poems and I don't know like I guess maybe you could like these poems if you liked the idea of being someone's everything you liked the idea of rescuing someone from their poverty, rescuing someone from their nothingness. Um, yeah, this sort of has like a Cinderella feeling to me. Um, I guess there's part of me that wonders, I'm like, is this real? Is this the reality? Is she really this poor compared to him? Is this the reality? Does she see herself correctly? Or does she see herself wrong? Does she see him wrong? Like, are her, is her vision of the world has it been, is it, is this, tr is this the correct lens to look through her world, to look at herself, to look at this man? And it just makes me wonder, like, this would feel, I feel like this would not feel like this sort of falling in love would be incredibly painful if every step of your falling in love meant becoming more and more aware of your own poverty. I feel like that would hurt really bad. <laughs> I don't know. That's just me. Um, so I'd be curious what you think of this, these poems. This is Sonnet 8 and 9 from the Sonnets of Sonnets from the Portuguese and Other Love Poems, Elizabeth Barrett Browning. I think that's all I have to say. I don't really know what else to say about this. And so I'm going to leave it there. Thank you so much for joining me. I'll see you again next time. <laughs>